Pet Protect UK, how can I help? Oh, hello there. I'm calling to inquire about your pet insurance plans. Of course. Just give me a second, please. Sure. So, have you checked our website already to see the options we offer? I've had a quick glance, and I think I'm interested in the basic plan. Great. I need to just ask a few questions first, then. Is your pet a dog, a cat, or a rabbit? It's a dog. And is it a puppy or...? No, he's three years old. Right. May I ask, has your dog been insured before? I just adopted him from the rescue centre last week, and I think he'd been there a while, so I doubt it. OK, so you've had him for a week then? That's correct. Great. I apologise for asking this, but your dog... What's his name, by the way? Fenton. Fenton. Is that spelt with an F? Yeah. F-E-N-T-O-N. -N. Great. Thank you for that. So, according to the Rescue Centre, has Fenton ever attacked, bitten, or been aggressive towards a person or another animal? No, not at all. Excellent. And is he a guide dog, or...? No, just a house pet. Great. And you said he's three years old. Do you know the exact date of birth? Oh, yes. It's on the adoption certificate. Just give me a sec. Um... It's May 19th, 2013. And do you know, has Fenton been neutered? Yes, he's been castrated. Excellent. And final question. What type of dog is Fenton? Is he a pedigree, a crossbreed, or a mixed breed? A uh, crossbreed, I think. Right. A uh, crossbreed... Wait, sorry. What's the difference between the three? A pedigree is a dog whose parents are of the same breed. A crossbreed is from two different breeds, while a mixed breed is three or more. Then he's a mixed breed. Sorry about that. Right, no worries. So, could I take your full name, please? My name is Peter Pishinger. That's P-I-S-C-H-I-N-G-E-R. Right. Thank you for that. And what's your address? That's 27 Cherry Drive, NW8 3HD. 3... H. D. And finally, a telephone number, please. 020-3634-7957. Thank you. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, you said you were interested in the basic plan. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. May I ask, are you planning to switch insurance providers after the first year of your pet insurance, or is there a possibility you might renew with us? I haven't really thought about it. Why? The reason I'm asking is because if you plan to renew with us, it might be worth considering our premium or ultimate premium plan. With the basic plan, you will have to pay the same fee of £8 per month regardless of how long you stay with us. If you choose one of our other two plans, though, you will receive a discount for the first six months. You'll only have to pay £12 for premium and £15 for ultimate. And then, depending on your circumstances, you might be eligible for further discounts after your first year, depending on how many expenses you claim. If you claim less than £300, you'll have to pay the same as for the basic plan, but receive the cover provided by the premium plan. Huh. Is that something you might be interested in? 
I'll have to think about it. Is it possible to switch to one of the other plans later on? Yes, of course. You can always upgrade. Let's stick to the basic plan for now then, and then I might call you back to switch. No problem. So, what happens now? Well, first we would need you to come over with Little Fenton so we can have a look at his documents and medical history. We'd also need you to get him to the vet for a quick checkup. All of this is standard procedure before we can proceed with the insurance plan. And then, when all that's done, you can either set up a direct debit in person or you can call us back and do it over the phone. Right. And the basic plan will cover... Well, the basic plan covers veterinary fees, obviously, plus a few more things such as boarding costs, loss by theft or straying, advertising and reward, death by accident or illness. You can find a comprehensive list on our website, or I could forward it to you via email if you prefer. Thanks. I'll check the website. No problem. So, shall we book you an appointment so you can come over? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Listen to the guided tour commentary and answer questions 11 to 20. You now have some time to read questions 11 to 20 first. Welcome to the library tour. We'll begin our tour of this level of the library here at the entrance. Then we'll go in a clockwise direction. So, first of all, over here on the left, next to the entrance, is a touchscreen information service. These computers can be used at any time to get general information about the library and how it works. In front of the touchscreen information service are the catalogues. As you can see, it's a computerised catalogue system and it's very easy to use. The catalogues are linked up to the other libraries at the university. So make sure you check which library a book is in when you are trying to locate a particular item. Next, along here on the left, we have the circulation desk for borrowing and returning books. The returns area the place for returned books and other items is at the end of the circulation desk, near Closed Reserve. Closed Reserve, as most of you probably know, is a collection of books that are in high demand, so they are on restricted circulation. If a book is on Closed Reserve, you can only borrow it to use within the library for three hours at a time. Over there in the corner are the shelves for newspapers. The library has an extensive collection of local and international English language newspapers. They are kept on those shelves for one month and then stored elsewhere. As we continue on our tour, around to the right, this large central section is the reference section. Reference texts cannot be borrowed for use outside the library. They must be used within the library. All these shelves in the centre of this level are the reference section. Now, the stairs here on the left lead to level 2 only. On level 2 are most of the law books. To go up to the other levels of the library, you have to use a lift. Beside the stairs are the restrooms for this floor. Now, as we walk around this corner to the right, this large room on the left is the audio-visual resource centre. You can come here if you wish to listen to a tape or watch one of the library's videos. 
Next to the Audio Visual Resource Centre is the photocopying room. There are 15 copiers for student use and we've recently added a colour copier. The system for copying uses cards, not coins. You can buy a photocopy card from the technician in charge of the photocopying room or from the information desk if he isn't here at the time. On our right, these work tables are for student use, especially for small groups to work together. Or you and your colleagues can use the conference room, which is that small room there next to the lockers. You can work on group projects in the conference room without disturbing anyone and there's a conference room on each level of the library. The round desk in front of the lockers is the information desk. If you need help using the catalogues or you need to organise a loan from another library, the information desk is the place to come. And finally, here, beside the exit doors, these two shelves contain current magazines and journals. Like the newspapers, they are kept here for a time and then stored elsewhere. OK, that's the end of the tour of this level of the library. I'll leave you to look around yourselves now and if you need any further help, please ask at the information desk. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between three students who are preparing a presentation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, guys. Oh, hey, Gail. You made it. Yes, yeah, sorry. I was stuck at the library paying late fees. Have you guys started going through the data yet? Yeah, we've already collated it and we've started designing the graphs we're going to use in the presentation. Oh, really? That's fast. Well, anyway, here's what we've got so far. OK, so... Wow, 38% said they thought about quitting school in the first year. That's a huge number. Yeah, and only 10% said they were happy at school from beginning to end. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah, I thought the majority would be happy here. Well, just remember that about 30% of the school population are foreign students. And from the UK students, only 2% are actually from the area. So, I guess it makes sense that people would miss home. Yeah, but to want to actually quit school. Well, they didn't want to exactly, they just thought about it. OK, so how should we organise the presentation? What did you guys decide? Well, Kevin and I were saying that we should start by explaining what the topic of our research was and how we decided to collect the data. So... I'll start by saying that our topic was how first-year students felt a month after beginning school and how their attitudes progressed and changed by the end of the academic year. So then we were thinking that I should explain that the population we want to study was obviously first-year students, but because we need their complete experience from the beginning to the end of their first year, we'd have to actually poll students in their second and third year. And then we said that you should explain how we access the population. So I'll say that we got the permission from the school to go to different classes from different departments and hand out the surveys in paper form, right? Right. 
and that it took us about three weeks to complete this part of our research. So then we need to describe the three different areas of focus of our survey. So Lindsay can do that. Uh, say that the survey had three sections. The first one asking just some general questions about the age, gender, nationality and field of study of each student. Then the second one focused on how they felt in their first six months at school. And the third, how they felt in the summer after their first year was complete. That sounds good. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 26 to 30. OK, so let me see the breakdown. Uh, OK, so we've got an equal distribution of boys and girls. That's good. Almost equal. 51% of the participants were boys. The rest were girls. Right, and 70% of the participants were British, while the other 30% were... 10% were from America and Asia, 2% were from Africa, and 18% were European. We had a small number of Australians as well, 0.03%, so I guess Europeans were 17.97% if you want to be precise. Which we should. Anyway, and obviously the age was all 20 or 21, with a few 19-year-olds. Only about 5%. No, wait, 4%, right? No, it's 5%, look. Right, OK. So Lindsay will describe the three sections, and then you, Kevin, you'll describe the demographic and geographical breakdown, and I... Uh, you can start with the graph, and then we'll all explain the data together. Right. So we'll put this graph up on the board and explain that most students experience some form of homesickness or mild depression in the beginning of their course. But we need to point out that by the end of the year, it was only 5% that still felt like quitting school. Yeah, but remember that we didn't actually have the opportunity to interview or poll any of the students who left school, so the information we have only relates to current students, and those numbers might be bigger in reality. Yeah, I guess we need to mention that. But we did check the dropout rate for the last two years, and it was very low, so at the end of the day, the numbers can't be much bigger. Yeah. Anyway, so after we explain the data and we show the three graphs with the background information and the responses for six months and one year, we should spend some time also talking about... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. I'd like to talk about the changes to our leisure time, and I'll start by talking about lifestyle changes over recent years for women. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like to talk about the changes to our leisure time and I'll start by talking about lifestyle changes over recent years for women. As we all know, the wife and mother of the family has traditionally been responsible for organising and completing household tasks for the family. However, particularly over the last decade or so, we have seen a greater number of women continuing to work after marriage and returning to work after having children. This has significantly reduced the amount of time available for household chores. The result is that nowadays the majority of people own and regularly use products such as dishwashers or microwaves. The modern family often considers hours spent on cleaning and cooking as a waste of valuable time and generally we are all interested in finding ways of reducing the number of hours we need to devote to such tasks. While washing machines have long been thought of as necessities by families, nowadays so too are microwaves and dishwashers. These goods can drastically reduce the amount of time we need to spend running our home and increase the amount of time available not only to go to work, but also to spend on leisure pursuits. As society develops and we become richer, we put more value on our leisure time and our possessions. The richer a society, the more demanding it becomes. People are no longer happy to work long hours for little return. Expensive holidays, expensive clothes and cars all become more important the more materialistic the society in which we live. Acquiring things and joining the race of acquisition means that modern society spends a lot of time and money purchasing unnecessary goods. Although expensive and persuasive marketing techniques are partly responsible, the demand for such goods often comes from young professionals, those with the money to endlessly upgrade things simply because a better model is made available. Our obsession with the newest and best products available, while good for the economy, can also have a negative impact on the environment. It is not appropriate to overproduce appliances and overuse electricity to keep these unnecessary appliances operating in our homes. We often forget about the damage we have done to and continue to do to the environment. Others opposed to the overuse of appliances and technology also argue that from a social point of view, over-reliance on gadgets means that people are losing the ability to be creative. Traditionally, it was considered an enviable skill to prepare meals night after night for our families. Nowadays, women are more likely to gain approval from others for their success in their careers than their ability in the kitchen. Along with microwaves have come ready-cooked meals, pre-washed vegetables, and our reliance on takeaway food when we are too busy to cook it ourselves. While there are obvious advantages and disadvantages to our increasingly active buying behaviour and changing wants and desires, it is likely that our desire to purchase labour-saving items will continue. So it is therefore inevitable that production of such goods will increase. We can only hope to educate ourselves and our children to buy goods we need, not just goods that are available. And we must also consider their environmental impact. In short, Moderation is the most important word for the future. I thank you very much for coming today and listening. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.